Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we excuse the, uh, Mayor Gotell and uh, Council Member uh, Elliott Elliot. for this evening for and for the previous, and for the work, previous session. work session. Okay. Yeah. I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mm -hmm. All right, next we have open forum. Do we have anyone? No one's here for that. Then let's stand and uh, join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to its flag, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay, next item is approval of the minutes of the regular City Council meeting of October 22, 2013, the special City Council meeting of October 26, 2013, and the special City Council meeting of November 2nd, 2013. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we now have a presentation, the annual meeting presentation from the Planning Commission. And Rick Jabs is here to tell us about all of their activities. And if you have other members from, from your group that are here, please feel free to introduce them. There we go. Um, I don't see any other here tonight, but uh, as usual, I like to always at least give them a shout out and thank them for their this year's service. Um, the, the special meetings and all that kind of stuff, they put in a lot of extra time. and. So as usual, we need to make sure that we thank them for their efforts as, uh, as we've gone through the year. So it's pretty quick uh, highlights for the, for the year, but it's important to uh, at least uh, give you uh, what we had done for this year and so that uh, the public gets a chance to, to hear that as well. So we start out with um, the November uh, 2012, and uh, we recommended an approval of a conditional use permit to allow seating to be added to a single de mile restaurant at 811-813-66th Street. I also recommended approval of an adult day care center at 6630-32-Penn um, Avenue and recommended approval of an additional uh, Mother Duck Learning Center at 6341-Penn Avenue. Uh, we took off uh, December and uh, <laughs> January. There were no meetings in those two months. In February, we came back with the full agenda, recommended approval of a uh, renewal interim use permit for the car hop used car sales at 6529 Penn Avenue with an added stipulation requiring an annual meeting with the staff to discuss redevelopment of the site. <coughs> Recommended <coughs> approval of an amendment uh, to an improved site plan that would allow an increase in the number of persons served at an adult daycare at 6630-6632 Penn Avenue. Recommended approval of a conditional use permit for a funeral establishment that would allow the National Cremation Society to locate offices, only services, at uh, 6501 Nicollet Avenue. We rec recommended approval of a final development plans for re the redevelopment of the northern portion of the former Lindale Garden Center into a mixed use development with housing, retail, restaurant, and outdoor activity space. And recommended approval of an ordinance amendment related to dimensional requirements for parking stalls and drive aisles. There was no meeting in March, and in April we came back and approved a conditional use permit and variances for a Taco Bell at 140 78th Street East. In May, we recommended approval of the final development plans for the development of the southern portion of the former Lindale Garden Center site as a 25,000 uh, square foot co-op grocer and recommended approval of rezoning and final development plans for the construction of a new Honda and Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi campus. Uh, June approved the 2015 and through 2018 capital improvement program and a finding of consistency with the comp plan for the capital improvement program and the 2014 capital improvement budget. And recommended approval of a conditional use permit to allow a full service restaurant with alcohol services Elton, to, uh, to be located at 6501 Nicollet Avenue with added stipulation that the applicant, property manager, staff, and a neighborhood representative meet to discuss ongoing nuances, nuance, actually it was noise issues. 
um, and recommended approval of an interim use permit to allow temporary Honda parking at uh, employee parking at the 7700 Pillsbury Avenue, which is the former city maintenance uh, garage while they're under construction, and recommended denial of an amendment to the Cedar Point Commons planned unit development that would permit construction of a fast food restaurant with a drive through service uh, that was the McDonald's at the corner of 66th Street and Richfield Parkway. In July, we recommended approval of a site plan to allow an adult daycare at 6722 Penn Avenue. There was no meeting in August. In September, we recommended denial of an amendment to the Cedar Point Commons planned unit development that would permit construction of a fast food restaurant with drive through service for McDonald's at the corner of 66 and Richfield Parkway. This was a new application consisting of a revised plan. And then to, to finalize, in October, we recommended approval and amendment to the city's zoning ordinance in order to clarify noise attention, attenuation requirements for a new residential construction in the designated airport impact zone. We recommended approval of an amendment to incorporate 77th Street underpass official right of way map into the city's zoning ordinance. And finally, recommended approval of amended parking requirements for <coughs> restaurants serving minimal alcohol that are located within shopping centers. And with that, that's the, uh, the year's events. And uh, to give you a recap. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for your good work. And we yeah. appreciate all that you and your fellow commissioners handle and do for us. Thank it's you. It's been a fun year, so thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, Presentation regarding the Richfield Snow Removal Ordinance and Winter Parking Restrictions. Mike Eastling and is going to introduce, I think. Yeah, please do that. Superintendent, well, I'm going to get the right you, presentation. You wanna, we didn't hear that, Mike. Um, the Chris Link, he's our operations uh, superintendent, and he's going to tell us about the, we're going to get snow, we think, this winter, and we think we're going to have to do something with it. And he's going to explain what that is, if I can get the right uh, presentation. Mike, take it. We dodged one bullet this year already with the three to six inch forecast of snowfall. So this is about as good a time as any to talk about snowfall. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I can get started anyhow. Um, <laughs> You'll catch up. <laughs> right. Um, unlike other cities, we have a winter parking ordinance rather than declaring snow emergencies. And that winter parking ordinance basically states that after two inches of snowfall, um, cars cannot be parked on the street until they're plowed curb to curb. Um, if they are uh, on the street, they can be tagged and or towed. And this ordinance is in effect from November 1st to April 3rd. That's basically how we operate. Um, there you go. That'll work. Um, this, this, the picture you see on the slide, it, it's a, a sign some of our guys actually developed. Um, we, we blanket problem areas with that sign just, just as an extra notification. But as far as snow plowing operations, um, we're using multiple different methods just to, to inform residents of what we're doing. So we will use a city website, um, Facebook, and, and Twitter. Um, we've got a snow emergency or snow information hotline, and the police actually, the reserves blanket cars starting in roughly October. They put flyers with, with the ordinance right on the flyer of cars that are parked in the street. So uh, we're trying to get as much information out as possible. Um, the use, um, the website, Facebook, Twitter, I am, I'm putting this plow start times. So if anybody's out there, um, follow those, and, and we'll have as up-to-date information as our, our, our snow plow options will have. Chris, what's the, um, when they're fined, what's the amount of the ticket? I'm not 100% sure. I, I, I could guess. I think it's $35, yeah. if I remember right. Well, that's close. But it's close. the tow that cost them. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so much mm -hmm. the... Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. But before he goes, I got a question. Go it's a it. trivia question actually for the council. What does the city do with all the leaves we pick up? We compost them somewhere, right? Maybe at, yeah. at the uh, Woodlake Nature Center? Why don't you answer for them, Chris? Yeah. We actually uh, uh, have an agreement with Fort Snelling Cemetery. We haul of all of our leaves, all of from the fall sweeping to the cemetery. They use them. They, they, they pre-dig graves in the fall, um, fill them with leaves, and, and <coughs> that's how they use them. Okay. We've done that as, for as long as I can remember. And you want to tell them about the website you were talking about? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, we, are, we are still street sweeping. So it's a calls. We've been getting a lot of calls about street sweeping lately. Uh, we still are street sweeping. You can follow kind of the progress where we're at, where we've been on the city's website. If you go to the public works page, um, we, we keep a map updated weekly. And, so, and so we're still out there. And another question for you. Occasionally, I will see someone sweeping leaves, raking leaves into the street. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's ordinance against that also um, we do not provide that service we don't we don't provide a leaf pickup service for the residents really. so they need to bag them mm -hmm. or compost them or compost and, and just to uh, just to echo on to that I mean it's very important that people do not sweep leaves into the street because they end up going into our into our storm sewer system and uh, ends up uh, being a, you know it's a big problem for the city to have that storm sewer system full of leaves and other debris. Um, and, um, you know, it ends up uh, either clogging the pipes up or ends up being in one of the uh, holding ponds that we have. And uh, leave, there's no space for leaves to be there. <laughs> A lot of silt. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. All right, council discussion. First item is should we cancel or reschedule the Tuesday, December 24th, 2013 regular city council meeting? That happens to be Christmas Eve <laughs> for those paying attention. Um, I'm not planning to be here. I don't know about the rest <laughs> of the group. Um, I have 40 people coming for supper. So, um, and typically we have actually canceled it. I don't think we've ever rescheduled it. Yeah, let's cancel. I, I move yeah. we cancel it. Is there a second? I'll second it. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Um, OpenGov.com. Steve, do you want to tell us about that? Actually, I'm gonna, uh, thank you. I'm going to let Pam talk about it. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying that um, for those who didn't see it, it uh, there was a very nice article in the Star Tribune about Richfield mm -hmm. uh, and about OpenGov, and I'm going to let Pam talk about it. Thank you. Well, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, um, just wanted to take this opportunity to again let the public know about this new budget transparency tool that we launched um, just about a week ago. It's, um, we um, are doing it in association with a company called OpenGov. They're out of California, um, and we're proud to um, be the first Minnesota city to utilize this tool. And what really, um, prompted us to do this was obviously the desire to be transparent with information that we have and specifically the budget and helping people better understand the city's budget. And, you know, we do post our 350 plus page budget document online, but you wonder how many people really understand or, or you know, want to access information in that kind of format. So this new format, which people can access on our website, really allows um, anyone visiting the website to drill down into the city's budget, see it in graph format, pie chart, um, whatever, whatever way um, is, is um, best for them, and, and see, in fact, trends, because we have at least uh, four years of budget information on there. So anyway, we, we hope people will take the opportunity to to go online and use the um, new tool, and we look forward to getting some feedback. And please let us know if you if you get feedback as well. Um, and do you want to tell people what the website is? Well, they go right to um, it's uh, yes. I think the Richfield is it. Do you have it right there, Sue? I did, but I can't find it. Well, it says OpenGov.com on the our right. Notes, and but you know, I apologize. I should have that, but you can go right to the City of Richfield.org. And right now we're featuring it in the spotlight. So if you click on that, you'll go right to our 
it's on our budget page. Um, so normally when we're, when we're not spotlighting it, it's, it's accessible right at our budget page. Mm -hmm. There was, you could also, there was a direct website as well, I recall. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and I, I think, think it was it like slash slash. And I don't have that information the there. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> I apologize for that. Yeah. So, and I thought I had it, but I don't, I'm sorry. But we did get some good press. Um, as mm -hmm. Steve said, um, there was a front page article last Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had gone to the Star Tribune's site itself, there was a video um, mm -hmm. with one of the reporters pulling the tool up and showing people how to use it. And I noticed there were a lot of positive comments posted up as well. So we're feeling pretty Great. good about it. And I, I guess there was, a, <laughs> there was a, um, an email being sent around to a lot of other by a law, local uh, law firm here in the Twin Cities, basically mm -hmm. saying uh, for, the, for all those cities that uh, they have contact with, hey, take a look at uh, this open uh, gov system that Richfield is using. So that's kind of nice. Gotten a lot of calls from cities today. So yeah. from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys have really done well. I mean, that's uh, to take the initiative and actually put something together and, and be the only city in Minnesota to have it. It's a nice feather. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. What Ridgefield does, it does well. Thank you. Okay, hats off to Hometown Hits. Other things that we want to share? Well, I got a few items. Go <laughs> if for you it. don't mind me going for it. First, I'd like to say we had an awesome Halloween in Richfield. I don't know about anybody else, but um, I had over 81 little goblins come up to my house. But what was interesting is uh, talking to the people that were there, they weren't from Richfield. Uh, they were coming in by the van loads. And it was interesting to think that uh, the parents thought the reason they came here because it was a safe community and they thought the kids would get a lot of candy. So it was kind of interesting. And I want to give hats off to a couple addresses in Richard. We had on 74th and 4th, they made the news. That guy had just the greatest haunted house. And then uh, he had a bin out there uh, afterwards so that uh, people that wouldn't fit in their costume next year, maybe even us, <laughs> could throw them in there and he was going to donate them to a cause. But there was a lot of great houses in Richfield. And you could just see the tour of people winding through getting all these addresses. So I, I thought that was awesome. And it was a great comment to think that they felt safe trick-or-treating in Richfield. Mm -hmm. So I have to comment on his house because um, it was a nice afternoon. I, we did, I did not take my mother out Halloweening, but... <laughs> But the next day was a very nice, warm, sunny day, and my mom wanted to go for a drive. And so we drove by that haunted house. You know, the whole, the whole yard was decorated with just every, every go goblin or ghost or character you've ever seen in any science fiction or horror show. And um, so she made me go. We drove by it, and then she made me back up, and then I had to go back again. <laughs> so she really enjoyed it. So... Um. The other thing I had, I wanted to mention, uh, last Saturday they had coffee with a cop over at the, is it, I don't want to get it wrong, it's Caribou over there on the east side of town, and I happened to go visit, you would get a free cup of coffee, and uh, the police were over there, and they had one squad car there, and it was a constant stream of kids going through trying to turn the siren on, so it was interesting, they were all excited to see it, but I thought it was a great concept to, uh, at first, people didn't know if they were there to have coffee and they could talk to them, but once they put little treats out, people came. But it, it was uh, well attended, and I thought it was great. Also, uh, Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, uh, Monday night, we did the Vets Memorial, and uh, we had a little ceremony there in the cold, and we uh, had the American Legion there, the VFW, and representatives from Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, and it was actually a lot of a lot of fun. It was really about 30 people that got together, and it was fun because we learned a lot there. Uh, they did a, a burial cer ceremony that the uh, VFW does, and uh, it was kind of our stance that we're not going to let that thing ever go another Vets Day without having something there, so it was good. And uh, Mayor got to cross off her list. She got to light the cannon. So if any of you need to light a cannon, you'll have to show up next year if it's on your bucket list. And then there's one other item I'd like to put up on the screen here. Okay. Now, I don't know, hopefully you can see this real well, but I wanted to acknowledge one of our businesses, and i got to read this real quick. Um, it's Gray Duck Tattoo. If you look at it, these are beanbag uh, 
platforms that they did. And I want to acknowledge, if you look at them, how ornate they are. But they donated to the uh, city of Richfield for the silent auction for the uh, charitable uh, campaign. And I think it's awesome that uh, somewhat a controversial place, you know, you always think of tattoo parlors of not being really involved in the city. I think this is awesome that they went forward and did these great platforms, put them up to the city so we could actually raise money for charity on this. So my hat's off to that tattoo parlor. So. Okay, thank you. Edwina? Well, I just, I just wanted uh, to um, commend the uh, residents of Richfield for, for voting positively on the school technology referendum, for voting yes twice. Uh, I think it just shows that we are really committed to our kids and to the success of our kids and our future. And also wanted to congratulate the new school board members, Townsend, Malik, and Polis. Uh, I think that's, um, that's a good, solid message too, because I think people feel that it's, it's nice if school board members have kids at school, and, and I couldn't agree more. So um, I think the Richfield citizens did well. And I also want to follow up, you know, with, um, with that ad, with that opengovs.com. And, and then, you know, prior to that, we had the 70, 77th Street um, article in the Star and Tribune, and we've had uh, the liquor store highlighted in the business section. So I, I think we really are, are doing well uh, once again, you know, in making sure that we're on the map and that we count. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm glad that we're on the right road, regardless of what we name that road. <laughs> Edwin is referring to an earlier council discussion <laughs> item about the potential renaming of 75th, 76th Street, which we will see. But that'll be something that we're going to be asking the citizens to give us some suggested names, and we'll be having the chamber involved and the residents involved and businesses to see what would be most appropriate. Um, hats off to hometown hits, I think, are covered if there's anything else. Otherwise, um, next item is agenda, uh, approval of the council agenda. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And I'll have Mr. Devich tell us all about the consent calendar. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. Tonight we have a very lengthy consent calendar. <laughs> and for those in the audience, consent calendar can contains several separate items which are acted upon by the City Council in one motion. Once that motion consent calendar has been approved, the individual items and the recommended actions will also be have been approved and no further council action on the items will be necessary. We start off with item A, which is consideration of approval of a resolution supporting the Move Minnesota campaign, addressing the need for a state-level comprehensive transportation funding package. Item B is consideration of the approval of a purchase order to Ziegler Incorporated for the purchase of a front-end loader for the Public Works Department in the amount of $225,165 plus tax and license fees. Um, item C is consideration of approval of a resolution authorizing the city to enter into an agreement with Three Rivers Park District for winter use for the Nine Mile Creek Regional Trail. Item D is consideration of approval of a first read of an ordinance amendment to the Richfield City Code Section 551, which is zoning official map, to include subdivision 551.02, 77th Street underpass, and scheduling the public hearing and second reading on December 10th, 2013. Item E is consideration of an approval of the renewal of the pawnbroker and secondhand goods dealer licenses for 2014 for Metro Pawn and Gun Incorporated and University Cash Company LLC doing business as Abe's Pawn and Jewelry and setting a public hearing on December 10th, 2013. Item F is consideration of the approval of the renewal of the on-sale wine and on-sale 32% malt liquor license for 2014 for Thompson's Fireside Pizza, Red Pepper Chinese Restaurant, the Noodle Shop Company Colorado Incorporated doing business as Noodles and Company, two locations. Chipotle Mexican Grill of Colorado LLC doing business as Chipotle Mexican Grill. Lariat Lane's Patrick's Bakery and Cafe, Joy's 
Patea, Patea Tea Thai Restaurant, boy, there's a tongue twister for you, <laughs> and setting the public hearing on December 10th, 2013. Item G, consideration of approval of the renewal of the on-sale intoxicating and Sunday liquor licenses for 2014 for Khan's Mongolian uh, Barbecue, Champs Ordering Corporation, doing business as Champs Restaurant, uh, Minneapolis Richfield American Legion Post 435, Fred Babcock VFW Post Number 5555, doing business as Four Nichols Food and Drink, Don Pablo's Operating Corporation, doing business as Don Pablo's, Wiltshire Restaurants, LLC, doing business as Houlihan's Restaurant and Bar, The Frenchman's, Pizza Luce 7 Incorporated, and Financial Guidance Incorporated, doing business as Four Points by Sheraton, and setting the public hearing on December 10th, 2013. 2000, December 10th, 2013 is going to be a busy evening, as you can probably guess. <laughs> Item H, consideration of approval of first read of an ordinance amendment section, amending section 544.13 sub 6, which is related to parking requirements for restaurants serving minimal alcohol that are located within shopping centers. Uh, item I is consideration of approval of the first reading of, an, of a transitory ordinance vacating a street right-of-way easement adjacent to and within the boundaries of 6401 Penn Avenue, which is our fire station number two, and calling for a public hearing and second reading for December 10th, 2013. And finally, item J, consideration of the approval of the first reading of an ordinance 541.19, amending noise attenuation requirements for new residential construction in the 2007 60 to 62 and 63 or greater DNL contours and scheduling the second reading for November 26th, 2013. And that concludes tonight's consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I do have one. When we're talking over here about uh, Don Pablo's, AKA Don Pablo. Thank you, Edwina. You're All welcome. right. <laughs> um, next item is number seven. And this is dealing with a proposed first reading of an ordinance to modify the electric franchise fee on Northern States Power, doing business as XL Energy, and also to a first reading of an ordinance to modify the gas franchise fee on Centerpoint Energy which provides gas services, obviously, both provide utility services within the city of Richfield. And then we would be scheduling a second reading on this in December, the first meeting in December. And what this is going to amount to is a $4.10 per month increase for the Excel utilities for residential properties, and similarly, a $4.10 per month increase on the Centerpoint Energy. Um, so the total increase would be $8.20 per month on our residen residential properties and a slightly higher amount, uh, if I recall correctly, on the um, commercial properties. And I've asked Mr. Eastling, who is here this evening, to explain to, um, to the public at home why it is we're considering increasing the franchise fees um, and what we're going to try and accomplish with the money. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, what I'd like to do is just start off by saying that this is something that the council and the staff has been dealing with since the beginning of the year during our, our goal setting. We kind of signaled that it was going to be time we, we need to do something different with our residential streets. And so we followed up that goal setting with a, a meeting in May, a study session where we kind of mapped out how we were going to look at what those changes might be. And in September, we actually came in and, and talked about uh, how we would really need to, to, to mill and overlay the entire section. And then in, in, in uh, October, we talked about how we could fund that, and that brought us to the place we are today. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is just talk about how, uh, what the mill and overlay program is. We've, we have a residential road pavement management program. We've been seal coating our residential streets. They got constructed 40 years ago, and we've just been putting a, uh, kind of the oil and gravel mix on top over the, over the last number of years. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk about how these franchise fees, how that can offset the costs that we're going to incur to, in order to do this mill and overlay, and then talk about how we're going to communicate this to the public and how they can have input with it. Okay. Uh, first of all, just the, looking at an asphalt pavement section, there's a graphic that shows that the, the, uh, 
that the top, the, the asphalt pavement on the top, and then in, in yellow you see the gravel base, and then the subsoil underneath. Actually, so the, the, the parts of a good uh, asphalt section are, it, there's, there needs to be a good uh, foundation. There's the asphalt mix, which is the blacktop mix that comes in on top. The thickness of the installation is key in that. Uh, there's, the quality of construction is important, and of course the proper maintenance over time. And I, the, the, the dis distinctive thing, the unusual thing about the Richfield pavement is that when we did, you know, uh, 40 years ago, when the decision was made to put in the streets, it was decided to really go with what's called an all black. So instead of coming in and putting a gravel base, they put a, a five inches of black top on top of our very good sandy soils. And that turned out to be a decision that now 40 years later, I think is gonna save us a lot of, a lot of, a lot of money. And I'll show you that in a second. So the, all the streets were paved between 72 and, and 77, and this is all the residential streets. I'm not counting the main county roads that are concrete and, and like 66th Street, Penn, Portland, Nicollet, those kinds of streets are not. So they're getting to be up to 40 years old. Um, most of the time, the expected life of a street, 20, maybe 30 years, you might expect to get out of a street, and we've stretched, it, stretched this out to, to 40 now. Um, the, uh, this great success is, is attributed to this great base, this, this sand that doesn't hold any water, the depth of the asphalt that I talked about, the five inches, and the city's commitment to the pavement management program. So uh, when the surface of the street started to crack up and maybe some water started to get down in it, we'd be there with our, with our seal coat where we'd put this layer of oil down to, that kind of seals that water out of there. The seal coat literally is to seal the water out of there. And we stayed on top of that, and, and I think we've done a pretty good job of extending the life of that pavement because of it. Um, what, what's interesting is here is, is uh, looking at streets in, in uh, on, this is on 62nd Street, and the center line of the street is the city boundary. On the right-hand side is the city of Minneapolis, and the left-hand side is the mill and overlay section in Richfield. It's how our, our section that was, was just a mill and overlay compares to a completely reconstructed road in the city of Minneapolis that's, a, that's, that's actually fairly, fairly new and is still showing some, some wear already on that section. Uh, and now this graphic shows that what we did is we, we, we contracted with a, a testing, uh, an engineering testing outfit that came in and did cores. We actually uh, got a piece of the asphalt from different sections in the city to find out if we were to pick off the top layer of asphalt is the bottom layer in good enough shape to reuse it. And I've got a, an example of one of these cores that I, I'd like to show, if they can yeah, show us up on, this up on the camera. Here's the about five inches of blacktop that you'll see it's in front of every home in, in Richfield today. And a typical section, and, and when we, they, so they, or the company came in and cut this core out, and what was interesting is that this one even separated into the various sections that were identified earlier. This bottom section is a base, has a little more oil than what you might put on top. And then this top layer right here is what was put on at the time that, that was served as the wearing course. It's a little, it's a little uh, denser, a little, uh, uh, can take wear a little, easy, a little easier. And what I'm putting on top right now is over time when we kept adding that oil and rock and oil and rock and oil and rock, to do that three, four, five times, and pretty soon another layer uh, builds up on the top of that. So what we're looking to do with the, the mill and overlay is take this top section that's beginning to show the wear that's cracking up, and that's what shows up in the, in the graphics that I'll, that I'll be showing. Uh, and we're gonna preserve this, this, um, this good asphalt, and this testing company assured us that this is a, a very, good, very good base yet, and we'll be able to put a new, a new top layer on top. So that's, that's what the, uh, an, an overlay would be. So we mill this off, Mill this top layer off, and then an overlay them the top piece, the top layer. That's what we're looking at doing. Um, here's you can is some examples of the streets that really are starting to get beyond what we can piece back together again with the with the seal coat. They're 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 showing their wear pretty wear pretty badly. Uh, in round numbers, we have about 100 miles of residential streets. We've had about 15 miles that have shown premature wear that we've come in and mill and overlaid. Some of these were some streets we had to replace some pipes and some, especially some storm sewer project where we came in and, and replaced the, the section. So there's about 15 miles that are in, in good shape and relatively new and are not that 40 year age of the rest of them. But there's 85 miles of, of this, the remaining residential streets that have to be done. So right now with the funding that's in place we can get maybe on, on average about two miles a year so that means that it'll take 43 years to get all the way through the city it was that number that we were staring at at the beginning of the year that that led us to having to take a, take action and actually try to get it done in a in a more accelerated fashion 
So, and the council then kind of reinforced these values that when we reviewed this with the study session, this is what we heard. The Richville does take pride in their streets, that, that we're committed to not letting the streets fall apart. And we prefer to, prefer to preserve this existing infrastructure rather than wait for it to maybe fall apart maybe and, and not do, take the action that's right now and maybe run the risk of having the bottom layer of this, for example, start to fall apart on. So it's time to reinvest. So we implement a six-year mill and overlay. So instead of 43 years, you, you compress that down to six years. And that what that means, though, is this these franchise fee money that we've been collecting at that lesser rate that we talked about earlier, um, that, that the council member referred to, um, the, that we're going to uh, have a, an increase in that franchise fee and get in there and, and get the, the, the entire uh, street system overlaid. But we'll have to bond to get that done. And we're going to increase the franchise fee then to pay off the bond. So the estimated cost to do this mill and overlay is about $20 million. Um, at the same time, we'll do any repairs to the concrete curb. That's a, that's a good time to get it done because we'll be able to um, match in then with our new asphalt to, a, to, a, to, a, to the new grade that's at the any replaced curb. We'll put the asphalt overlay in. Um, one of the biggest reasons that streets fail is that the, the, the utility system, the manholes that are in place, they move around differently than the street, and a lot of times they'll go out, and the, the, where the street is wearing out fastest and where it's worn out the most is around these manholes. So we're going to come in and, and do a really good job of making sure that, that we do the repairs needed around those manholes. Uh, we really think that if we wait and try to put off this decision, it could be very costly, and I, we put some numbers to it. Uh, that if we had to replace all of the blacktop, including the base, it'd be more like $45 million. And if we were to come in and completely reconstruct these, we're certainly in excess of $100 million. So we think a, a timely investment of $20 million is a, is a uh, good investment. And by the way, by the time you completely reconstruct, then we're into some probably some significant utility costs once the road is exposed that we'd probably take care of at the same time. Um, here is just a, a chart where we show the, the franchise fee increases, and we've been talking quite a bit about the, the residential one uh, uh, increases that go up to 410 for both gas and electric. But there's other meter sizes that are shown here that the larger the business or possibly an apartment, that the, the larger the meter, the, the larger the franchise fee that would be attached. And you said 410, but you really meant four dollars and ten cents yeah, per I month, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, how to get there? So we're here at the at the tonight's meeting. We're going to set the public hearing that's going to occur on December 10th. We're going to inform the residents through a citywide mailing, and of course, in the website. There will be an open house that not we are that we're going to have a chance to in a more informal setting kind of explain you know some much of what we talked about here. But anybody that maybe hasn't had a chance to see this and has questions about it will get a chance to come to the open house to ask questions about that, so that they can be informed by the time we have the public hearing. And then and then after that we talked tonight about a communications plan that is going to be begin to uh, take place up and before December 10th, but afterwards then we're going to do it a job explaining not only the mill and overlay, but some of the other street improvements that we're going to be doing. Yeah. So I think that's it. And, and the Assistant Public Works Director, City Engineer, Kristen Asher's name is on there. She's the one that's been leading this, this effort, and she would be the one that, if anybody has any questions, that be sure to contact her. So. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that's very helpful for people to understand. Before well, you go, yeah. I, can I ask go a ahead. question? Sure, absolutely. In the paper, everybody saw it. That all mm -hmm. the other cities' streets are crumbling because of the asphalt mix. Maybe you can explain that why that's sure. not happening in right. Richfield. <laughs> well, um, well, first of all, I should say I don't I don't know as those other cities know what the problem is. All I know is we're not experiencing it. But there, I showed some streets that were kind of having some potholes after 40 years. Well, some of these cities that maybe had streets 10, 15 years old were starting to experience that kind of deterioration, and and um, I. Myself, I said, you know, we have such good soils. We're very blessed with that. This sandy soil it is, is just a, a wonder to put a street on. And, that, and, and so if uh, those other cities that have soils that hold water are running into some problems. And, and we th right now, the, uh, they suspect that the actual asphalt mix itself wasn't, wasn't quite what it should be. And all of the cities were using that. 
And, and uh, it, I think right now there's a lot of finger pointing going on, <laughs> so I hate to speculate, but they're having a lot of problems with their streets, and they're having to make the investment that we've put off for 40 years, they're making it after maybe 15 or 20, or, 10, or, or, or even sooner in some cases. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Mayor, for yes. time, if I could just add, you know, onto uh, what Council Member Fitzhenry just asked. You know, the other way of dealing with it is the way some other cities deal with it, and that is when the street uh, portion in front of your yard gets to, you know, has to be replaced, then it's assessed to you mm -hmm. as the property owner. And Mike, you're, you're a better judge of what those costs are, but um, in some of the other cities that, that do it that way, um, you may end up then facing, what, maybe a uh, 10,000 or do more uh, dollar assessment, could be more than that, correct? Right, and you know, I can give an, a specific example here if we want okay. to take a look at that. Um, here is an, in a Lakeville neighborhood that's a 70s neighborhood. Now our streets were putting in, into the 70s. This neighborhood was established and the street was put in in the 70s. Their, their entire street failed and not only that, they had, they had problems with their, their utilities too. They had 13 water main breaks on one block in here <laughs> in just in about 10 years period of time. I mean, it was, it's been uh, very costly then to go in there and replace these utilities and the streets. And so in, and at the, in that same 40 year time frame, they're looking at a $7,000 assessment plus another 18,000 in city costs plus utility costs. So there's a $25,000 plus uh, amount of improvements in, in a 40 year time frame. Right now we're talking about uh, maybe $1,500 or so per lot after, you know, over 20 years that we're gonna be able to collect and, and do the same kind of thing. And so the bottom line is, this is a much gentler way <laughs> of having residents uh, pay, for, um, pay for this very expensive infrastructure. I mean, nobody sees streets as a glitzy kind of thing, but when you look at it, I mean, it's one of the fundamental infrastructures that every city has and needs to maintain. And, you know, the condition of your streets says a lot about the conditions of your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, um, Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's important to maintain those streets, and uh, it has to be done. I think that uh, the plan that Mike and folks at Public Works have come up with is um, is a brilliant way to handle it. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think Sue probably appreciates it being a corner lot where they would have a lot of frontage on a street. Two <laughs> sides, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I just want to reiterate, I believe you said that the um, open house for the public is December 4th. The open house is Wednesday, uh, December 4th. And then the hearing, the public hearing where the council will vote to go forward finally is on December 10th. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, In the letter. Uh, In the, I don't think it's in the council packet. No, that it, no. It, um, it, it's it a, from after from a, it's like a four to seven kind of time frame, and I, but those that will be in all of the the, the letters because I can, I see that they did not we did not identify it in this letter here, but and that will be here at that city will be here at city city hall. Okay, thank you. All right, any questions from council? Otherwise, I'll go ahead and move this. Um, I would like to move that we approve the first reading of the attached ordinance modifying the electric franchise fee on NSP doing business as XL Energy for providing electric service within the city of Richfield, and schedule the public hearing and the second reading for December 10th, 2013, and also approve a first reading of the attached ordinance modifying the gas franchise fee on Centerpoint Energy for, for providing gas service within the city of Richfield, and schedule the public hearing and second reading again for December 10th, 2013. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number eight. And that is. I think you gave it to me. I did. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, item number eight is a consideration of an award of a contract to Durao Construction Company f of Minnesota for the Magician's Locker Room Edition at the Richfield Ice Arena. Uh, if you haven't been there, you gotta go see the magicians. <laughs> the Richfield Ice Arena has now become home of the Minnesota's newest tier two junior hockey team, the Minnesota Magicians. 
To remain financially viable, the team has promoted the sale of tickets to home games and attracted large crowds. In order to accommodate the new team and larger crowds, a number of building improvements are needed at the ice arena, including the construction of a dedicated locker room, weight training area, lobby extension, and exhibit area slash classrooms. These improvements will not only benefit the Minnesota Magicians, but other users as well that require additional space for large events. Council approved agreement with Wold Architects on September 10, 2013 to proceed with the design of the locker room uh, addition only. The estimated cost for the remaining improvements was greater than anticipated and further pre-design work in progress to keep the cost of the remaining improvements in line with the added revenue needed to finance the improvements. A bid opening for the locker room addition was conducted on November 5, 2013 and 14 bids were received. Daru, I hope I'm saying that right, <laughs> construction offered the lowest responsible bid. In the attached contract is approved. Construction will begin November 15, 2013 with an anticipated completion on March 28, 2014. Funding for the locker room addition will be from a 15-year lease with the Minnesota Magicians with an annual lease payment in the amount of five or fifty-three thousand dollars. Now, did we have a staff report that we wanted to bring forward? Sure, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members, members of the audience. Uh, Jim Tapaso from the Parks and Recreation Director, and you know I think the report that you read uh, was pretty thorough. I just wanted to reiterate: this is just the locker room that we're we're doing at this point, and the reason why is. Uh, over the summer, uh, we did a pre-design process with Wold, and we looked at these other improvements, which, uh, it, you know, would uh, further accommodate the team, but would also accommodate a number of other users. And um, the funding for those types of improvements are what we would anticipate bringing in extra uh, in ICE rental. Uh, uh, and so the cost of those improvements were a little higher than what we originally thought, so we're just being very cautious. We're, we're, we're gonna still uh, proceed with a, uh, with a proposal for you probably in January for the remaining improvements, but we wanna make sure that we stay within our means. So that's why we're s s sticking with just the locker rooms only, and that is funded entirely through the Minnesota Magicians. Um, they've started their, their season here. They've, they've done their draft, they've got a team. Um, uh, and uh, they started in September, and their attendance is growing. I think their last home game, they had 850 people mm -hmm. come, and it felt like a good-sized crowd. So, um, you know, the, the, the more that we help them be successful, uh, bring crowds in, the more they can make money, the, the better position we are financially to have them as a leasee for those 15 years. And so um, I've asked Mike, class to come from Wold Architects. Wold Architects, by the way, were the original architects for the original ice sheet. So they're coming full circle back to uh, uh, redesign a little section of this uh, uh, right now and then the rest of the improvements. So I've asked Mike to, to come in and explain um, the design of the locker room and answer any questions you might have specific to the project. Mike? Thanks, Jim. Um, uh, basically, the uh, what the plan that we were asked to proceed with is to try to make a, a relatively compact locker room addition that really, as Jim said, serve the needs of the team. So we did spend time working with uh, not only city staff uh, from the from the arena, but also a representative from the magicians. And so basically, what we came up with was essentially uh, what they'd asked for was obviously a uh, larger. Uh, locker room area um, just to support the uh, the hockey players um, cubby areas and that kind of thing a shower area uh, certainly a toilet area um, a small office for the coaches and then a couple of accessory spaces like a, uh, a kind of a workroom uh, set up so um, basically we kept it within uh, roughly the, the square footage that we had originally anticipated and, and, and the cost fell in line as well. So. 
Mr. Klaas, where where does that fit into the current I'm sorry, um, good question. It's actually on the northwest uh, portion of rink one, so the so on the side uh, closest to the uh, to the Legion and kind of Veterans Park there. Okay. So the nice thing about the construction is, is since it is in such an isolated area, it really won't have any impact um, on the operations of the uh, uh, of the arena for the next couple of months uh, until they literally uh, break a hole into the side of the existing building. It should be relatively uh, unseen for the most part. So. Okay. Thank you for that report. Anyone else have any? I was just going to mention that if you look now, they're working out of a trailer. <laughs> you see them it. going out of the trailer, and I encourage everybody to go see the magicians. I mean, the magicians are. Yeah, yeah, they're actually working out of a trailer there, and uh, the, you're right, the crowds are improving, and team's pretty good. The Friday night, they had a shootout, won in that, and are actually lost in the shootout Friday night in Janesville, and then Saturday night, yeah, I thought they were going to lose, but ended up with three to two, but... It's a great time. You can go there. What I like is your beer doesn't get warm. <laughs> <laughs> you can sit out there and your beer don't get warm. So, okay, well, I'll go ahead and uh, move it that uh, we accept the bid minutes tabulation and award the contract to draw construction in the amount of $510,900 for the Minnesota Magician Locker Room Edition at the Richfield Ice Arena and authorize the city manager to execute the contract documents. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine, Edwina. Okay, this is a consideration of an appointment to fill a youth term on a city advisory commission. And we interviewed earlier a young man um, that we have three commissions that, that have um, young people that serve on them, the Advisory Board of Health, Human Rights Commission, and Friendship City Commission. And this young man applied um, to be reappointed to the Friendship City Commission. And we know that he has really um, performed well and been a great c contributor to that commission. He's, he's um, also been to Costa Rica, and he's, he's been to, uh, to where else was El Salvador. El Salvador. El, El Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, pronounce it right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so, and, and um, so he wants to stay on, and, um, and, I, and we felt that that would be a good idea because he is such a valuable uh, part of, of the commission. He's in the 11th grade, and he goes to school at uh, Eagle Ridge Academy. And so I will, uh, so we will um, place him on the Friendship City Commission, and I move that that be done. Second. And I third it. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10 is consideration of the council's confirmation of the mayor's appointment of an HRA commissioner. And Steve Quam is retiring as from the HRA after his five-year term ends. And so he is not seeking reappointment. And um, the council directed staff to recruit some good new replacement members for the HRA. And we interviewed seven great candidates. Any one of them would have been excellent serving, so it was a tough decision, but we didn't make it. The mayor gets to a point. Mm -hmm. And so she has um, wanted to thank all of the candidates who interviewed um, and confirmed what I just said, and that is that they were all very eloquent and did a great job, um, and any of them would have been excellent. But we can only choose one, or she can only choose one, and so she has nominated Mary Supple to serve on the HRA for the next term. So um, the mayor has placed her name in nomination, and then it's up to us to, as the city council, to confirm that appointment. Is there a motion to confirm the mayor's appointment of an HRA commission for a five-year term commencing November 12, 2013, and expiring November 12, 2018? I'll make the motion. Second. And All right. Any discussion? 
No, I just wanna, I, you know, I think those of us that were there and mm -hmm. I was just surprised how well prepared they were. And, uh, and a lot of them that we knew very, very well and, and uh, it was a tough choice, very tough. Very qualified candidates, all of them, so. All right, I'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. And then we will notify Mary that she is expected to attend a Monday night meeting next week. So we'll go from there. All right, um, back to the agenda. City manager's report. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the city council, I really don't have anything to report. Okay, claims and payroll? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we have no further business to come before us. We therefore stand adjourned. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>